Goldie, amazing to see you. Um, thank you so much for giving us your time. Just let me, just tell me about how you're, you are coping in this pandemic and how are all your family and the kids that you have to look out for? We're doing fine. We're, 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 we're doing fine. We're obeying the rules. We're wearing our masks. So we're spending time together. Uh, we've all been tested. We've been very safe. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're doing fine. I think right now my focus really is outside of the family because the family's doing well. And what I've been doing for the last 20 years of helping children manage their emotions and helping parents manage their time and understand what it is to be mindful. Uh, these are the things that we're doing now. And, and the most important thing, because after COVID is over, the, the, the spoils of this are going to be on our children, our families, our economy, uh, depression, mental illness, and mental distress is going to be very high. Um, so we have a lot to, to do, and a lot to be aware of right now. This is a challenge for a whole generation right around the world, isn't it? It's not just kids in, UK, in the UK. It's not just the kids in the US. This is a generational moment, isn't it? What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, when I first started Mind Up, the program, it was really for children globally. And the reason was even before COVID-19, and I have been doing this for 20 years, I was noticing uh, some issues around children's emotional stability. Uh, instability uh, and a lot of anxiety and sadly suicide. So I started this then and it was for a global community, not just for America, not just for Canada, not just for the UK, but for everywhere. And the reason is, is because not only are we feeling stressed in the world itself with the advent of all our technology and things that are stealing a lot of our intimacy, a lot of things that really are working against us as humans, I wanted to help put the children and understanding of their brain back in the driver's seat so they would understand how to manage their brain and manage their emotions. Today, more than ever, we are dealing with this problem now, front and center. So it's a global issue we're dealing with, and that's why we need to band together as, a, as, a, as, a, as the world should and share, share our feelings, share what's going on with us, and feel that we do have a global community. Our children right now, because they're so young, don't think this is ever going to change. They think this could be this way forever. And we have to share with them and be open with them and not leave them in the dark because they're very anxious right now. So you know, this is the kind of stuff that I'm working on every day and trying to figure out ways to disseminate this information in, an, in a different way because we've always been in schools. Now we're remote. So now we look at how do we remote how do we do this in a remote way where we can bring wellness to the children and, and, and give them these tools this way within our curriculum? It's very tough. You set up a lot of this important work in the shadow of 9-11. What lessons are there from the fallout, the terrible fallout of fear and sadness for that moment in America, for what the world is going through now? Well, it's not dissimilar. Um, what we're dealing with now is a little bit of a, you know, it's an, it's, an, it's an enemy we can't see, right? So it makes it even worse. Uh, but in terms of anxiety and fear, that of itself has a very negative effect on our emotional stress and our, our system. And if our brain cannot manage our stress, if the brain actually doesn't know how to overcome stress, then fear comes in, uncertainty comes in, behavioral issues come in. Symptomatic behavior comes in, depression happens, because there's no tools. We're not giving our children or our parents tools to deal with this. And there are tools. There are programs like mine out there that have been evidence-based and proven. And we have to absorb the truth here and go, let's start young. Let's give our children all we have, because they're going to inherit tomorrow. So the fear and the anxiety and the catastrophizing and and all the anger that goes back and forth and what's going on inside the home. And I mean, you name it. And also, you know, our media doesn't help because it just goes on and on and on about what's going to bring people back to the, to the telly. And it's going to be, oh, something's going to happen. Oh, we're going to catastrophize. You know, the brain actually is a negative bias, which means that we are basically there to salvage, to save us, that, that part of the brain. 
That's when it was we were primitive. But now we have things that are they're emotional that are stopping us from functioning, stopping us from being critical thinking, stopping us from really learning how to supplant a more positive emotion in, in, instead of the negative. So we can do positive education, which we have. And we must think about this. This is really important. This isn't something, this is a fly-by-night thing. This is a new way of helping children and for adults build a toolbox that gives them a way to deal with their emotional constructs. And right now, they're very, very, very limited. So anyway, you know, I don't want to take this over, but as you can see, I'm very passionate about what we can do and the solutions that we have to be thinking about and not just the problem. How do parents navigate this with their children, Goldie, when they themselves are worrying about the virus, worrying about what comes next, worrying about the economy and whether they have a job at the end of this, trying to get homeschooling done? What advice have you got for parents when they are so gripped in the teeth of this pandemic? I'm not a doctor, you know, in terms of understanding this, but I have been many years in research of mindfulness. The idea of understanding how mindfulness, quieting your mind, and really getting to a space will actually create greater attention, greater ability to be in this moment. If we can't be in this moment, then, then we, we are catastrophizing the next moment that hasn't happened yet. We have to, in some way, embrace this moment, whatever this moment is, and even if it's the last moment, this is what we must have. The ability to look at your children, be with them, talk to them, share with them. Don't lie to them. Let them know that you're a little nervous too, but we're going to get through this together. Share the family unit with them and know that there's been all kinds of things in the world that people have actually gotten through. Lots of world wars, lots of things that we've dealt with, lots of pandemics. We get through this, honey. This is the way we are. We're resilient. We're humans. We can do this. And the more you tell your child this, the more you will understand to believe it too. And the idea that tomorrow is going to be horrible and the next day is going to be worse and the next day is going to be worse. I'll never get a job again. I'll never, and all of this fear and self-talk, if we can hold on to these moments that we have so our brain just doesn't overtake us and create this negative, horrible world that we can't get out of. There are lovely things to be grateful for every day. Every day, I, I don't care how little it is, it doesn't matter. And the reason why we're, gratitude is important, it changes the brain. It changes the way the brain is firing. It emits it, 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 it dopamine and serotonin and all of these things that we need to know about how our brain works. Dancing, dancing, these kind of things that I believe in, laughter. If, if we lose these aspects of being human, then we've lost everything because there is trouble always around the corner. It's never going to be perfect. We're just going to have to deal with that. Just pull ourselves up and deal with it. And as far as we don't, we're not going to get a job. The economy is going to be terrible. I mean, I could sit and I do, and we talked about this, I know on another channel with Pierce, but I do get upset. But you know, I it hurts my heart to see what's going on. But if I cried every day, all day, then I wouldn't be able to lift anybody else up. I wouldn't be able to be there to be a voice of reason or to be a beacon of light. And, and I think that if we realize, realize that we do have light inside of us, we all can help. We're going to deal with what we have to deal with. And I just think that that's the most important thing for our mental health. Because if you have the best job in the world and you have bad mental health, and bad mental stability. You're not gonna be happy then either. So we have to get a hold of some of these negative emotions and turn them around to a more optimistic, more positive way of looking at things. Even when things look grim, we know that around the corner, down the street, that light at the end of the tunnel is gonna be seen. And that's my philosophy. As I said, I'm not a doctor. But I do believe that if we're going to sustain a sense of well-being, it's our job. It's an inside job. And so it's that's it. Look, look how excited I get. <laughs> Does I look at this and I think, you know, there was a time when I was actually making people laugh. <laughs> 
And you still, but I mean, and, we're all for everything. <laughs> and and you still do. And it's just, you know, it's lovely to see you so lit up and so passionate about this. Um, you know, your work is now being carried out in schools in America, in Canada and in the UK. It's sort of hard to overstate how important a role teachers will have in these coming weeks and months, isn't it? Yes, it is. And we need to help them. And, and in, in many ways, I'm, I'm sort of looking in my way to help, you know, because we all say, how could I help? And I think some of us feel so helpless because we don't necessarily have a way to help. I'm so grateful that this program happened and I created all this. And I don't know, I didn't, but all the neuroscientists and everyone did. It's great. And what we're doing now in trying to help is to create our lessons in animation. And because we, we want to be able to share with them a way of uplift, a way of learning, and different ways that they can get into it. Now, this obviously, we're, we're dealing with kindergarten to eighth grade, but there are also other ways that we're dealing with understanding how the brain works for high schoolers, for people who are going through puberty, and all these things that happen to them. So we have to do the best we can to help teachers so they can actually press a button and show something for a child right there on Zoom or however they do it and connect connectivity in the classroom. These are such important things. And so we will figure out our ways of creating, whether it's safety, where we get together, just a few of us, we will become a family of man together. And it can be through what we're doing right now. It can be systematically making 10 people in a room and having a, a jolly time and laughing and enjoying time. But we will be able to help our teachers, I know, get some way of delivering uh, this, this uh, uh, teaching the way they're doing now. It's very, very tough. I've got so many stories that are just very hard. Keeping kids invested is important so they don't have to do all the work. So that's kind of how we, we're, I'm, look, I'm looking at it. Talk to me a bit about your own mental health journey, Goldie, because I know that this would have informed this work that your foundation does. You had fame at a very early age. You had to navigate that whole landscape of being this global star from such a young age yourself, what are your big life lessons that you can share with people? I took charge of my anxiety. I, I wanted to figure where it was coming from and why. I wanted to know more about who I was as a human, not who I was going to be. I wanted to know how to excavate the inside of my own brain and when I went in and I suddenly did, I did this for several years, it was extraordinary, giving me objectivity into the world that I lived in. But also to understand how to have empathy for others who actually liked what you did or didn't like what you did. It didn't matter because I was clear on who I am. And I did that because I cared to be the best person I could be. I cared to be happier. I was a happy child, and when I lost my smile for about a year, I was really, really frightened. But I wasn't going to let that put me down. I was going to know what I needed to do in order to generate a sense of care and love for myself and understanding of what anxiety does. What does fear do? Fear manifests in many ways. And I would have panic attacks and things like that, thinking, I just wanted to go home. I just wanted to be normal. Well, what is normal? There is no normal. Normal is what you have inside. It's how you actually live your life. It's the choices that you make. That's your normalcy. And I just think that that's how, what I learned. And when I meditated for the first time, I did a mindfulness practice in 1972. It, it, it was the most extraordinary feeling. I mean, I was sort of brought back home. I felt like, oh my gosh, I was just sitting inside of my heart. And it was, it was such a wonderful feeling. Now, that was me, and that was what happened to me. Maybe it doesn't happen to everybody, but it was extremely important to find peace and calm and security and, and an understanding that that, I, that that aspect of I can instead of I can't. And those are very, very different things from, from I can do it to I can't do it. You cannot be self-defeated. So that was what helped me. 
That's what changed my life from being anxious when I was at 20 years old and 21 and 22, wondering what my life was going to look like. Was I going to have a normal life? Was I going to be married and have children? I always wanted to be a dancing school teacher. Well, you know what? Plans change. Plans change. Things happen. Life happens. Microbes happen. All kinds of things happen. Right? And I look at it and go, okay, we're going to deal with this. Somehow we're going to deal with it. And I think it's attitude. So I, so that's it's an interesting question. Thank you for asking me. And I think that's pretty much what it taught me. Um, just on a, a wider perspective, this feels like a big moment for America, not just going through this pandemic, but in the wake of what we've seen with George Floyd, you're in an election year. This feels 2020 like a big moment for your country. What are you feeling about that? Can this be a, a, a moment of change, do you think? Does, what are your reflections on that? I think it is a moment of change. I've been through actually a lot of these moments of change, right? That we thought things would change. Um, I think this one is me different. You know, it started with the Me Too movement, is that suddenly people that were abused, uh, women that were abused, women that, you know, were, you know, marginalized in many, many different ways, and, and I certainly can attest to that. Um, the Me Too movement happened. I mean, it's pretty amazing when you look at what happened, and it's a quantum leap, and that's change. Change has a quantum leap. And, it, and, and, and more than that, I can't explain what that means because I'm not a physicist, but I do understand the idea of quantum physics a little bit. And when these things happen, they happen and they're there to stay. So this right now will be a very, very interesting, uh, I would say, uh, outcome to see if it is another quantum leap. We've spent many, many years with this kind of problem, this racial injustice. Many, many years. It has been very painful to watch. I grew up in Washington, D.C., and that was about 98% black. I didn't know the difference. I, I mean, it, I was a little girl, and I, it was like no colors allowed, and I didn't understand it. And, you know, some of my dearest friends were, were you know, color. And I thought, oh, my goodness, it, it, it just hurt my feelings as a little girl. So I, I'm looking at this and going, it's going to stop. It, it will stop. People are going to become are much more aware. And this starts with our children, by the way. So when we go into the classroom, we're going to realize now what we have to, our way of bringing us together. We all have the same color blood. We all have the same beating heart. We all have the same color brain. We are humans. And humanity must be actually looked at in many different ways for us people who are older to put, try to keep the humanity back in the kingdom. So I think that this part of where we are today is actually like the forest is burning and new growth comes out. And I'm looking at it as a disruption that actually had to happen. So I, once again, you know, I'm not looking at it as a catastrophe. I'm looking at it as this incredible opportunity for growth and restructuring of how we perceive things. Uh, and I think it's really important that we look at it that way because that's, that's the way we're going to take it forward and our children will take it forward. Um, j just a couple more questions. It's so fascinating to listen to you talk about this over such a wide range. Um, how is Hollywood going to tell the story of this pandemic, do you think? It's going to challenge story making from a practical point of view, but it's going to have to get to grips with this new narrative of what the human race has been through and try and interpret it for audiences. How do you see that going? Um, it's, it, right now, it looks insurmountable. Um, however, uh, I think that we will, you know, I, I remember when, this is, this is different, but I remember when the uh, writers went on strike many years ago. Um, we're ingenious people. We, we, really, really, we have all kinds of ingenuity. Um, and when there's a problem, we figure it out. That's when reality television came in. <laughs> People said, we don't need writers. Let's just do reality TV. It changed the face of everything. So that, what I believe now is that we're going to find new ways. And we have a lot of CGI. 
There's a lot of things going on in terms of, I mean, all our Marvel movies are 80% CGI. Um, but I also think that there'll be different kinds of movies coming out. And that'll be interesting to see because they'll be maybe a little bit more intimate um, and how we do. We, we don't have to have huge crews. Uh, I always felt that our crews were, we had too many crews anyway. I mean, I directed a movie and I had half the crew I normally have. And it was wonderful. It worked like a clock. So there are ways that we're going to scale down some of this stuff. Other ways, I think our stories are going to be compelling. Um, it, it, you can tell the time we lived in by the movies we watch. And you can tell the decades of the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the kind of movies that we were putting out at that time really reflected the time we were living in. So I think that this time and our business itself will actually reflect some of this as well. So again, an optimistic view um, because we always figure out a way. We, it's the greatest thing about being an adaptable human being and we are adaptable and we will adapt and we'll come out to go back to the the most important part of our conversation about kids mental health if we get this wrong goldie and we don't adapt and find a way to support our children through this what is at risk in your view oh it risks a society out of control it, it risks a lot of areas where children are not going to have the empathy that they should have it also risks ideas of not more greater a sense of narcissism because narcissistic personality disorder, you're not born with it. It happens because of how you were nurtured or not. And, and this is really important that we create a, a basic movement and putting as much as we can behind it and knowing that this could be one of the greatest, um, another part of the pandemic, which could actually not, not be very good or, or do well for our society as a whole, as a globe. You know, when I, when I, when, this is back to creating mind up, but one of the areas that I wanted to do is to create dialogue, was to actually create peace because a, a person who can actually feel peace can create peace. But those people who are living in turmoil and brain frenzy and all of these things, they don't understand what peace is. They don't honor it. It's because they're anxious. There's too many things going on. But when a child can actually feel, know how to put themselves to bed, know how to relax and understand and manage their emotional construct, to really know that they're feeling angry. And it's really better to take some breaths and focus and calm, calm down, only because it changes the brain and how the brain works so they can think better. If you don't have this capability anymore, and this is the greatest technology out there, is our brain. As if we don't take control of that, then we we will not be doing well in this in this world. We won't be caring about you know the ecology and and our, our climate change. We won't be caring about each other. We won't be there you know caring for our moms and dads when they're dying. We we, we literally are going to be cut off from an emotional response to, to 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 human beings on the planet. We cannot live this way without that. We're nothing. And what is your message for families in the UK watching this? Parents who might be sitting with their kids and wondering how they navigate this uncertainty before them. From your experience working with child mental health, what is your message to them? You have to understand your own anxiety and manage it. That's the first thing. It has nothing to do with the child. It has to do with you. And once you're able to manage and understand how to listen, be calm, trust that at some point things will be better, can you then be of service to your child? You cannot love anyone until you actually love yourself. Give yourself the time to know that you are everything to these children. You are everything. You're their survival. You're their touchstone. You're the person they want to get angry at. That's okay. Please be patient because this is where you can help your child to feel stable and to feel resolved that they're safe. 
And that, I think, is the most important thing. Goldie Horn, it's been such a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you, sweetheart. Okay. Take care and hope to see you soon. <laughs>